Hello there. Welcome to our panel today. It should be an interesting one. Uh, Brian Levin is going to be speaking today from uh, Miami. In a minute, I'll let him introduce himself. My name is Tim Lappin. I'm an attorney in Los Angeles. I've been practicing since 1975, which didn't sound so long until I said it out loud. But uh, I love what I do. I've been practicing in the family office and luxury home group area and working as outside general counsel for clients internationally. Uh, and in talking with Brian, you're in for a treat today. There's a lot of, of interesting things that he's working on that hopefully won't apply to you right now, but they may in the future. And so it'll be an interesting conversation. I think you'll learn a lot. And one of the most important things I think for a lawyer to have the clients learn is uh, what should I have you look at before it gets too far down the road? And that's, a, you know, typically people think they'll call their lawyer when they need one. But uh, I think what Brian's gonna help us become sensitized to the areas in which he can add value before there's a perceived problem. So uh, Brian, welcome. I'd love to have you introduce yourself with your background and we can get started. Thank you so much, Tim. I really appreciate it. And sure. thank you everyone for being here and spending time with Tim and I today. My name is Brian Levin. I am a securities attorney based in Miami, Florida. I have a firm here that has both a nationwide and an international practice, and we represent investors primarily in claims against financial institutions. And what I'm going to try to do today is help the listeners understand what they can do to avoid needing my services, because a lot of people and a lot of investors and a lot of companies that end up hiring me are hiring me after things have gone wrong. And a lot of those things can be avoided entirely through uh, due diligence and really being practical, uh, smart, and really do all the possible research on investment professionals and the investments that, that you make. Yeah, I like the way you said that because I've always found that preventive law might be a dollar and curative law might be $5,000 or maybe not even possible. So the, the ratio for a client is, even though you don't know you need someone to take a look at something, spend five minutes, give Brian a call. I ask, I do, should I be concerned about this? I'm buying this investment or I'm going to hire this advisor and get some upfront advice. So I think it's great that you uh, highlight the fact that doing something ahead of time in the due diligence area can save a world of hurt. So yeah, well, maybe, I, please go ahead. Absolutely. So the types of clients who end up coming to me who have already had problems are investors of all sorts. Anything from unsophisticated people who might not even have co college or even high school educations all the way up to pension funds municipalities, hedge funds, private equity funds, single family offices, and clients of multifamily offices. And that typical client usually has a problem because they've lost money in some type of investment or investment product. And to be clear, what we don't do is we don't sue financial institutions simply because the value of an investment has gone down. All investments have risk. And the mere fact that your investment has gone down in value does not mean that you, in fact, have a claim against your financial institution. The types of investors who have claims are the ones who have not been informed of all the risks of a given investment or a investment advisor uh, or other securities professional has painted an overly rosy picture of an investment or there have been conflicts of interest inherent at the financial institution level that weren't disclosed to an investor. So the people who come to me already have a problem. They may have lost $200,000 and they may have lost $200 million. But once they've got to me, the money is already lost and our job often is recouping the money. But a lot of what we do is planning and we help people understand how to avoid that. Because in a lot of instances, we sue solvent financial institutions. And at the end of the case, there's a recovery, whether by settlement or through judgment, but a lot of times people invest money with pure out fraudsters who steal their money and disappear. And a lot of those fraudsters are in foreign jurisdictions where we can't even find them, much less find where the money has gone. So a lot of what we do is help people understand what to do so they don't find themselves the victim of that. And there are a lot of different things to do. 
And there are two different levels to look at. If you are going to entrust money to an investment professional, you need to do research due diligence on that person. If someone cold calls you, or if someone sends you an email claiming that they were connected to you through some friend that you never heard of, or even using the name of some friend, that's usually a red flag. And I get those calls all the time. And people call my cell phone, people call my office, people send me an email telling me that they'd like to tell me about an investment product. I generally don't invest with any investment professionals and recommend that my clients don't invest with any investment professionals that they haven't received a glowing recommendation from someone else. And the first point for most investment professionals is the internet. Google the person's name, Google the company's name. People would be shocked to learn the number of people that have invested with professionals or former professionals who have been barred from the securities industry, who have spent time in prison for fraud, then all they had to do was do a simple Google search. Another great resource is the FINRA broker check. FINRA stands for the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. And it has a system that you can type in the name of any licensed investment professional and find out if that person has had issues with regulators, if that person has had issues with prosecuting bodies, or if that person has had customer complaints against them. And then at the second level is really doing due diligence on the investment itself. And what we always tell people is, number one, make sure your investment professional spells out the risks and the rewards of any investment product very clearly in writing. And number two, make sure that you understand the investment product. As an investor, if you don't understand the investment product, you probably shouldn't be investing in it. And that's true from the least sophisticated investors to the most sophisticated investors. And those two steps, doing research on the investment professional and really doing research on the investment product itself can help people and companies avoid massive financial losses. Interesting. So a couple of points come up in that. One is about dealing with people who call you at dinner and ask if you want to invest money. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a funny thing that I've had clients who are worth hundreds of millions and sometimes billions of dollars who met their financial advisor on a cold call. And I'm always shocked that they would, they think that that's a good idea. Well, that person sounded nice and they knew someone. And of course, everybody who calls you is not a bad person necessarily. But uh, I like to tell my clients that if you can't drive over to the advisor's office or house, it's a much bigger risk to you because you really don't even know if they exist in the real world. They may just be a, a presence on the internet. They may not even have an office more than a mail drop as we've seen some, some pretty high profile uh, fraudsters. So how do you uh, do diligence? Uh, when you do due diligence, how do you do it for your clients on people who aren't anywhere near where your, your network exists? <laughs> That's a tricky question. I mean, I, I think the default is if you can't verify that the person or company exists physically, you know, that an actual office exists or that you've met the person in person, that's a point of, you know, do not pass go, do not invest with this person. You may, they may be nice, I'm a nice person, uh, but I would politely tell that person that you're simply not interested in investing. Um, it's just, it's just not worth it. I got a call last week from a very unsophisticated 90 year old woman in the South who had wired $800,000 to Thailand. And she was promised very, very impressive returns. And the person told her not to tell her children that she was investing the money because it was a private investment. Her money is gone. Um, there's, there's, there's nothing to do about it. There's nothing I can do to help that person. And the person seemed to think the federal government could somehow claw back the money. And that simply doesn't exist. That money is gone forever. Wow. I had a similar situation recently where a client told me that he listed his house and um, he listed it for $22 million. And he told me with whom as a woman who called him and had a great sound on the phone and knew a lot of people in other countries because foreign buyers were going to be the, the, the key to his happiness. And so I, I Googled her and found out, <clears throat> pardon me, in her own email introduction, in her own uh, web presence, her house sales were in the two hundred and eighty to four hundred and thirty thousand dollar range, and she'd listed my client's house for twenty two million. 
I said, do you think she's got a lot of clients in that area? Because she's been selling houses that are in the price of an expensive car in Los Angeles. Uh, but, you know, you hadn't done any homework on it. And the challenge is, as you well know, is that the person, quote, in Thailand could have been anywhere in the world. And even if the money were wired to Thailand, it frequently gets into an account and gets wired out automatically immediately. And it's skipped three or four regions by the time anybody knows it's gone. Yeah, that's that's a great point. And I think just being smart and being diligent uh, about that is really the key to avoiding those types of frauds. And anytime I have clients or friends call me and tell me that they're investing money with some some company that I can't find any meaningful information on, I usually tell them just to pass. Yeah. And they might be missing out on some great opportunities, but you can only make so many of those decisions, even if you're a really wealthy person. I mean, if you're if you're a really wealthy person and you're investing 10, 20 million dollars at a time, uh, and you do that a couple times, it takes a massive returns in your other investments to make up for those kind of losses. So I like to see people invest with usually known large financial institutions. Now that doesn't mean that you're gonna avoid investment loss type claims. In fact, most of my day is spent suing the largest financial institutions in the world. But if you have a problem, there's going to be a place to go. If it's Wells Fargo, if it's Morgan Stanley, if it's Merrill Lynch, um, at the risk of, of stating something that already happened, like those companies aren't going to go out of business, um, those companies probably aren't going to go out of business. Now, the footnote I dropped there is we had plenty of conversations with people who were invested with Lehman Brothers pre-2008. And I'm pretty sure that I probably said Lehman Brothers probably isn't going to go out of business. And it turns out Lehman Brothers went out of business. But the probability is those large multi-billion dollar or even trillion dollar financial institutions probably aren't going the way of the dinosaurs anytime soon. Right. So it's smart to invest with known large financial institutions. So we're talking about due diligence. Let's say I'm about to do a $100,000 investment and I call you. Uh, I don't want to spend fifty thousand dollars on figuring out if it's a good deal or not. If it's uh, that, what what is the due diligence going to cost to talk to you ahead of time and give you have you give me a heads up on the things that are obvious? So, just a, a point of point of note here is our firm is not actually a due diligence firm, meaning we're not going to comb through the financials and go through and make sure that the representations that are being made are true, we provide more of a macro consultation. And we typically don't charge for that. It's more helping the investor understand what they should be looking for and saying, have you heard of this company? Do you know anything about this company? And, and going through more macro decisions. There are other law firms that can be hired, whether it's for $25,000 or $50,000 to actually vet the underlying investment. But for most people and most investors, it's just not practical to spend that amount of money just to invest. So we just help people with bigger picture items of, did you go on the internet? Did you look this person up? Um, what do you know about the investment? And I think because we've seen so many situations where investments have gone wrong, that perhaps we are overly conservative because my default is to tell people not to do it. Um, because it does, like I said before, it doesn't take that many investments, that many bad investments to go wrong, to really mess up your returns on your entire portfolio. And, uh, and to the point about the due diligence, as you alluded to, on a financial instrument, perhaps it's more difficult and expensive to really drill down, although hopefully a person's accountant can do that. The things that lawyers would look for, I'm assuming in your case as well, would be, uh, are these market-related terms? Is this something, whether say a promote that goes 20% off the top to the promoter or the, I think as importantly, who are the people behind it? Who are the lawyers and accountants behind it? And what can we find out about them and actually call them and ask them if they really are behind it because people will pepper their documents with well-known names that know nothing about the fact that their names are being utilized because they're not involved at all. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. I think there are two things to note there. With, with private investments, uh, securities that are sold typically pursuant to regulation D, of the federal securities laws that aren't registered for sale, it's much easier for fraudsters and not even necessarily fraudsters, but 
selfish people to sell those types of products and really put themselves first. So your, your point is a great one, particularly with private investments, whether it's a real estate investment or a venture capital investment, a hedge fund or private equity is looking at the offering documents and see who, seeing who's behind it. And if you had the financial resources to do it, you could hire a lawyer like us to really look it, into it and see if the accountants are really involved and if a big name law firm is really involved. But a lot of those things can be done simply by picking up the phone because you'll see a law firm listed and calling and asking about that. Uh, another great point that you just raised is cost and expenses. And when we, when, when I personally look at investments, I always look at what are the upfront costs and what are the annual costs? Because if the upfront costs are too high, it makes making a profit that much harder. And I've had clients who have passed on a lot of investments because the investment has an upfront commission to the financial advisor of eight, nine, 10%, and then two or 3% per year. It's much harder to even break even on that investment when you have anywhere from you know, five to 20% of the investment being eaten up in fees because you have to make that return just to break even. Um, and that's a really good part of the due diligence process is making sure that the investment simply isn't too expensive from a cost and expense standpoint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I like uh, personally to see deals where what I call most lawyers like to use the phrase alignment of interest so that the promoter, for example, gets nothing until the money goes back to the investor and then maybe the investor gets a return on the investment and then the promoter starts getting some money out. And so irrespective of whether the person's honest or not, it's just the economic value. So I, I like to say to clients, are you, uh, what would you prefer to lose money because the person's a crook or because the person's incompetent? And of course the answer is C, none of the above. They don't want to lose money either way. So they, they tell me this person's really honest. I know a lot of people, they're the same, we're in the same faith, we're in the same golf course, uh, I mean, golf uh, membership. The fact is it doesn't always mean anything. The person could be a really nice person and try really, really, really hard, but they still don't know what they're doing or they haven't hedged some of the bets that they've taken. I mean, look, even large insurance companies, we had one in Southern California that did a lot of earthquake insurance and they 90% of their policies were in one zone, which got hit by an earthquake. There was no diversification. So that kind of risk that someone's taking on uh, an investment is really important for someone to analyze. So I think between you and the client's accountant, that would be good. The other thing I find interesting is if I'm working, say, with uh, uh, Morgan Stanley or J.P. Morgan, and I get a private investment that looks interesting, to send it to my financial advisor and ask that person to take a look at it and tell me what he or she thinks, because that's their job. Because even if the deal looks good, they may know 10 other deals in that space that are going to come out. And you, know, you don't want to have a great idea for a, say, electric car, and then find out that they're 15 other cars coming to market by highly capitalized companies. That's a great point. And I actually had that happen relatively recently. Uh, someone forwarded me, a friend of mine forwarded me a private deal just to get my thoughts on it. And I said, I'll, I'll send this to my financial advisor. And I sent it to her. And within the hour, she emailed me back. She said, well, there are upfront costs in the first year of around 20%, number one. Number two, it was, it was an automotive related investment. Uh, the research report that they're relying on is nearly two years old and the outlook on the auto industry has changed dramatically. And number three, these guys seem to have no experience in the auto space. Um, those were all red flags for me. I mean, those were, Absolutely. those were things that, you know, would, mm -hmm. I, I pass the information on to a friend and, you know, those, those are the types of things that you want to look at. And, and Tim, you just touched on another point that's really important, which is diversification. Um, diversification from an investment standpoint, and I'm not an investment professional and I'm not giving investment advice here, but from a risk standpoint and avoiding needing my services and being the victim of whether it's investment fraud or just financial, you know, financial investment negligence, is don't put all your eggs in one basket. And if you have an advisor who's recommending that you put all your money in an energy-based portfolio or put 
you know, 50% of your money in a single equity position, or even 25% of your money in a single equity position, usually that's a bad idea. Because whether it's wrongdoing on the part of the financial advisor or simple market decline, you end up subjecting yourself to a massive amount of risk, unnecessarily so. And it's, it ends up being uncompensated risk. What's interesting about what you just said is that great concentrations have led to great wealth. But, uh, and it's like saying a good outside shot has led to an NBA career, but your chances are one in 439,000 of being that person picked. It's not going to help you very much. Uh, great concentrations have been made, but greater concentrations have, been, uh, have lost money dramatically because of that. And even people who were very astute investors, they had some uh, you may know of from the, uh, the, the downturn earlier in this uh, century, where they actually had very well-known financial advisors uh, commit suicide. They, they, they were completely blindsided by what happened. And certainly a lot of people didn't expect the pandemic to hit. And you have a restaurant in six different uh, zones of the country. You figure, well, I'm, I'm geographically uh, uh, diverse. And then look what happened when they all got shut down. And then each city and each state had a different rule about how you can come back as a, as a restaurant and whether they get any special uh, treatment under the law. So it's, it's, it, there's a lot there and not every risk can be ameliorated, but certainly for the things that you see on a regular basis, I would expect that some homework up front would have really increased the odds. Unequivocally, you, you raise a good point. A, a very a friend of mine who's a financial professional in California recently said to me, he said, do you know how the majority of people got on the Forbes 100? And the answer was concentrated positions in publicly traded in publicly traded securities, typically their own. And it was that's the same concentration of people who ended up off the Forbes 100 because yeah, um, right. it's a massive amount of risk. And the other thing is, if you're an ultra high net worth person, um, you should be in preservation mode. And to subject any significant percentage of your net worth when you are investing in a passive investment to a single investment just doesn't make sense from a risk adjusted standpoint. If you already have enough, you know, enough money, whether it's to live for the rest of your life or for the next 10 generations, to put a significant percentage of your money in one investment just doesn't make sense, which really leads to my next point is if an investment seems too good to be true, it probably is because the risk reward paradigm is real. And the more risk you take on, uh, excuse me, the, the higher the reward, the greater level of risk that you're taking on. There was a group of uh, investors who I represented about four or five years ago. And there were about a dozen or so families that invest in the same product with the same bank. And this was a little after 2008. And it was a, a, a European-based real estate fund. And the bankers were instructed by the bank to go around the world and pitch the product only to their, their best and their wealthiest investors. And the pitch was as follows. This is a gift. This is a fund that is having liquidity issues. And we are selling you the fund at 50% of the actual net asset value. And on the very first day you buy it, you will have 100% return. But there's a three-year lockup. And we expect, and I don't remember, it was a three, four, or five hundred percent return after the three-year lockup. Fast forward three years, the fund went down, and everyone lost every dollar. And there was about 150 million in losses. And it was a very aggressive pitch to very sophisticated clients of why this was so great. And for for wealthy, and sophisticated clients, it was believable that their bank was coming to them with their very best products. But the truth was, the bank was just offloading its risk. And while I did say that investing with large financial institutions is smart, it doesn't mean that you're always going to get honest and unconflicted advice. So if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't huge returns out there and you may, might not make a massive amount of money in a given investment. But if those, that's the type of pitch, you should be just as comfortable losing all that money. Well, and uh, there is a... a to that point, there was a group of investors, I think it was in the late 70s, who were pitched on the idea of renting 
irrigation pipes to be uh, used by farmers. And it was like a no loss deal because every farmer needs pipes. They don't want to own their own pipes. It's going to be a great deal. And by the way, here's the list of luminaries who've invested already. And they really had invested. The problem is nobody did any homework. And so as soon as one well-known person was in, the second one said, I'm in too. And then the third one said, hey, the two of them are in, I'm in too. And when the thing went down, everyone looked around and said, well, I thought you did your homework and nobody had done any homework. So that you can't assume that just because, I would say you can assume if Warren Buffett is invested, he has done his homework. But if it's say a, a movie star or a singer, um, no disrespect, but that may not mean that they've done any homework at all or maybe it's their cousin's friend who's their manager who did the homework, but you really have no way of knowing. You gotta do your own work in, in order, or at least it has to come from a source that you know is really unbiased and intelligent. Unequivocally, and you could look at really similar examples throughout history. I mean, the there were the ATM private placements, the payphone private placements, um, the viatical settlement private placements, all of which were were pitched as no loss investments for a variety of reasons. And we all know what eventually happened to the ATM investments, the payphone investments, and for the most part, the biatical investments as well. Well, when you look at FedEx, for example, it's a very smart company. And in the dawn of the age of fax machines, uh, they were expensive. They were two or three thousand dollars for a fax machine. So FedEx decided to set up a network of fax machines in their offices. So you could go in LA and I would take a document, then they would fax it to the Miami office of FedEx, then FedEx would deliver the document. And for like six months or a year, it was a great business. And then the price of fax machines dropped to the point where no one even has them anymore. They're so cheap, they just have scanners and just bypass the whole idea of a fax. But it wasn't for lack of knowledge, it just either they didn't have the foresight or they had bad luck of thinking that fax machines would not be a consumer item for a long time. It's interesting. It's similar thing has happened with taxicab medallions in New York City, because yeah. the value of taxicab yeah. medallions has been basically not eliminated, but dropped by about 90% because of Uber and other rideshare companies. Yeah, really good point. Well, let's shift gears a little bit. I know that you have a presence in Miami and Detroit and California. Um, do you work with clients who are in other states as well? And how do you do that if you do? So we work with clients throughout the nation and the world. And most claims against financial institutions are brought in private arbitrations, and which means you don't even necessarily have to file in court. And for people who value privacy, it's really important because unlike a court case, no one can go down to a public docket and pull filings or maybe get a deposition transcript or something like that. In most cases, the public isn't even aware of the filing. Um, most of those cases can be filed anywhere, and most states don't have any prohibitions on out-of-state lawyers practicing, and in the handful of states that do, we simply associate with local counsel. So for those cases, we can file them anywhere, and our general view, at least pre-pandemic, was if there was a new client who wanted to meet, meet with us, barring extraordinary circumstances, I would get on a plane or someone on my team would get on a plane and they'd meet with them. And plane travel used to be very easy and quick. Um, and we represent people, we still represent people throughout the country and the world. And that includes jumping on a plane and going to a foreign jurisdiction. Uh, the majority of my practice historically has been representing people in South America and Mexico and Central America as well. So the geography really doesn't matter from our standpoint, and even in situations where we're filing claims in court, um, we simply associate with a local lawyer if we're not part in that state. What we bring to a representation is our experience. What we bring to a representation is our relationships with banks and financial institutions. Because when we file a case, chances are the financial institution has dealt with me before. Um, they hopefully think that I'm a good and competent lawyer. And they hopefully think that, or hopefully take me seriously. And usually the lawyers on the other side are people we know. And that's true regardless where the case is. And we also get involved in cases outside the United States. Um, I've litigated cases with the help of Swiss counsel in Switzerland um, and other jurisdictions as well. 
interesting. So typically, though, when you have an institution that has an arbitration clause in their uh, subscriber or their customer agreement, does that provide for a, a, a choice of venue? Is it actually at the headquarters of the financial institution or is it where the uh, customer is located or where is it brought? So, as I mentioned before, FINRA stands for the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. And FINRA has an arbitration dispute resolution forum. And if you have a dispute with almost any major and, and smaller financial institution, whether it's Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, or Morgan Stanley, that's usually subject to a mandatory arbitration agreement. And under FINRA rules, the case is venued and the location closest to where the customer investor lived during the time in question. Um, so if you're in South America, your case would likely be venued in Boca Raton, uh, Florida. And if you were in Mexico, depending on where you are, your case would likely be venued in Houston. So even if you're offshore and even if you're, you know, if you're in Hong Kong or if you're in Mexico or even if you're in Africa, your case ends up getting venued here in the United States, um, regardless of where you are in the world. Interesting. Uh, let's also ask, uh, we, I know that you practice in other areas besides securities uh, involved cases and with financial institutions. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that and if there's some crossover between them or if those are just separate uh, areas of your practice. So our firm has some distinct practice areas, but they're all ultimately related. Um, we do some trust, probate, and estate litigation. Uh, and that is often an ancillary to a lot of the securities litigation. And the, the core idea behind it is the same. It's fiduciary duty litigation. And if you're suing a trustee or if you're suing, whether it's a corporate or individual trustee, there's usually some component of breach of fiduciary duty. And a lot of times we will have parallel claims. You know, For example, a, a, a woman dies and her, her estate unfortunately gets probated. Um, and then her son takes in as the per comes in as the personal representative and looks and mom's account went from $10 million to $1 million over the course of the year, the son is usually going to call me. So sometimes we'll have claims within the probate uh, or if it, there's a trust involved and also have parallel claims in the FINRA arbitration. We do class action work uh, in the securities arena as well as in the consumer arena. And we also do a lot of work with respect to shareholders' rights. Um, a lot of times representing minority shareholders who have been squeezed out by larger shareholders, whether it's in public or privately held companies, although more so with privately held companies. And a lot of the ideas behind those claims are, are similar to the securities claims, conflict of interest, breaches of fiduciary duty. And all those practice areas are distinct and don't always overlap. They are similar and kind of the philosophy behind them is all similar as well. Under the category, <clears throat> excuse me, of a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. A person might own 10% of a corporation and feel, well, you know, I didn't do very well there, but I only own 10%, so I really had no control. And as, as you well know, that me doesn't mean that the majority can do whatever they want. And so uh, that's another example of somebody needing to actually check in before deciding this is a total loss. Uh, statues limitations are important. Uh, they don't wait too long before they proceed against the, the evil doer. But uh, have you, you, I presume you and you've handled cases like that where the people on the majority side may have had the power to do something, but it wasn't the right thing to do or even permissible under the law. You, you just raised several great points, Tim. And there's really a question of what your legal rights are. And that's true in minority shareholder disputes and is true in securities disputes. And most people or most people who come to me often say, I didn't know I had any rights in this, in this regard. You know, an investment, a private placement goes from being worth a million dollars to zero dollars in a two month time frame, And the person chocks it up to, well, that was the risk of the investment. When in reality, that investment never should have been put in the hands of the investment professional, never should have been sold to them. And that person might have a claim. That person often doesn't have any idea that they have a claim. In the what I'll call the, the shareholder oppression, which is what it's referred to in Michigan, and Michigan has a, a very, uh, I'd say, protective shareholder oppression law. Um, a lot of the minority shareholder, a lot of my, minority shareholders, 
don't appreciate that they have any rights. So if the majority shareholder does something that's detrimental to that person, they don't realize they have rights. And my recommendation is if you think something has been done wrong, there's not necessarily something to do, but you should absolutely consult with a lawyer and find out if you have rights and do it quickly because statutes of limitations apply. And if you wait too long, you might be forever barred from bringing a claim, not because that something wrong didn't happen, but because there are laws stating that you have to bring claims worth in a certain time frame, And sometimes they're very short. For example, in Florida, claims against, certain claims against trustees have to be brought within six months of the beneficiary being, being told about the trust. So don't assume you have time, pick up the phone, call a lawyer, um, and find out what your rights are and how quickly you have to move. And uh, you know, I like that area of the law myself quite a bit. And I wrote an article called What's a Trustee and Do I Really Want to Be One? Because it's a, uh, uh, it used to be, and it wasn't that long ago, that being a trustee or a corporate director was sort of a, uh, a, a, a magnificent appointment by a trusted friend. It was something that said, I'm going to make some money on this, and I get to say that I'm a director of this or a trustee of that without realizing the great fiduciary duties that these people have in, in being trustees. And so uh, what I tell people, you, law, you know, lawyers like to have defined terms. And so they may say so-and-so trustee here and after defendant, because they're the <laughs> ones who are gonna get sued when they don't do the right thing. An easy example is the trustee of an insurance trust who never analyzes or has analyzed the insurance policy underlying that trust. It should be looked at every year and they find out it's a five or 10 years later, it's an underperforming trust uh, asset that should have been replaced, but it wasn't, or they didn't send out the required notices, the crummy notices or whatever. The obligations of trustees are, are really many. And that, do you do that kind of work where you advise uh, people who create trusts, uh, what kind of responsibilities the trustees have? That's unfortunately not within my my practice areas. I'm somewhat laughing because I just redid my own life insurance trust. Yeah. And anytime any friend calls me and tells me that they're considering being a trustee of someone else's life insurance trust or revocable or irrevocable trust, my general recommendation is don't do it um, because it's a, it's a thankless job. And there's a much higher probability that you're going to find yourself a defendant down the road, simply because your name was on a document that you didn't really appreciate you had any obligations on. Um, and I think that's true as in, in other fiduciary capacities. I mean, it's one thing to do it for, you know, your spouse or a kid or something like that, although I'm not even sure that's a great idea. Um, but no, that, that's, that type of planning is not within the sphere of what we do, although we do know a lot of professionals who can help with that. Well, the way I would uh, illustrate that risk is that a, a family office that's worth, uh, say, a billion dollars says to a trusted person, I have some good news for you. You're going to be the trustee. We're going to pay you one million dollars a year. And uh, God willing, I'll live at least 10 years. You'll make 10 million, 12 million dollars. And when I die, my kids, my four kids will each be worth about 300 million dollars. If they decide to sue you, I'm sure the 10 to 12 million you've made over the past decade will be more than enough to pay the legal fees to defend yourself from these <laughs> multi-million dollar centimillionaire centi children of mine who are going to be unhappy about one thing or another. Like, well, why was, why was Billy's trust in this deal and Susie's wasn't? And uh, why did you buy that office building that's no longer worth much money? Yeah, no, that's a great point. Although there is a point where financially it might it might be worthwhile. Um, certainly, the the no compensation trustee usually is not worthwhile. Well, that's for sure. It's also sort of a rule. It's almost like the Peter principle. If you're doing work for free, and maybe on the, on an annual basis, it's only forty hours for the year. Thirty nine of those hours will come when you're phenomenally busy with other things, and it'll be really resentful of having to take it on at that point. So. I, I agree. To, doing it for free makes no sense. At least, at least the trustee should have an indemnification clause in the trust that says, if I get sued by the beneficiaries, the trust will pay my uh, legal fees 
And that will not work, of course, if they actually did something wrong or the court agrees that they did something wrong. You can't benefit by your own uh, bad actions. So let me ask you, since people will say sometimes, you know, it sounds great to have all these legal services, but I'm not a real wealthy person. I can't afford a big time lawyer like Brian. Is, is there a, a minimum wealth level that people have to have for you in order to be a client of yours? Or do you represent people across a, a, a broader spectrum than that? Uh, we absolutely represent people across a broader, broader spectrum than that. And our firm represents clients on a variety of financial arrangements, ranging from pure contingency, mm-hmm. where if we're filing a claim, we don't get paid unless we recover money. And a lot of situations, we advance costs to pure billable, where we're paid by the hour. Sometimes we're paid flat fees or a series of flat fees or a combination of, of any of those. But most of our representations are contingency fee representations. And a lot of people who hire us uh, don't have any money left. They, you know, they, they invested with a financial professional who put them in a bunch of investment products that are worth nothing or they're worth 20%. They don't have any other money. Um, we also represent the ultra wealthy. You know, we've represented people who are worth billions and billions of dollars. Um, and we treat everyone the same. Everyone gets the same concierge service. It doesn't matter if you have a hundred thousand dollar net worth or a $10 billion net worth. We treat all clients the same. And if there is a way that is both advantageous for the client and my law firm, we do our best to come up with terms and we take on some smaller cases sometimes. And sometimes cases are only over $200,000 and we take large cases as well. I mean, we've had recoveries in, in the nine figures. Um, and ultimately the goal and the philosophy behind our firm is really to help people. And to make everyone realize that they have rights and if they've had a problem and there's wrongdoing, there's recourse. And although we can't take on every single case that comes in the door, we do our best to help people in ways that we can. And you talked before about uh, representing clients vis-a-vis banks and uh, uh, brokerage houses. What about the smaller operators, a private promoter of an investment or of a hedge fund or private equity deals and things like that. Are you taking those kinds of cases? Yes. Although I I wouldn't say we're more selective. They're just a little different Um, because a lot of times in a a lot of situations where investors have invested in in maybe a a standalone deal, uh, there might not be anyone to sue. I mean, if you invest through a financial institution, if, if, for example, if your financial advisor recommends that you invest in a, in a certain private equity deal and that financial advisor didn't do their homework and didn't conduct adequate due diligence, we can bring a claim against the financial advisor. Uh, but ultimately, we need some solvent third party. And a lot of private equity firms may engage, well, private equity firms, hedge funds might engage in some type of wrongdoing, and they may be large enough that it's worth suing. But unfortunately, we can't get blood from a stone. I mean, if the if you invested with a hedge fund operator who has no more money and fled to some foreign jurisdiction, there's nothing left, we can try to help, but there might not be anything to do. And filing a lawsuit against a person or a company that has nothing isn't helpful. But we do bring those types of claims. And we also represent private equity companies and hedge funds in claims against other financial institutions. Uh, sometimes in more technical type claims where you may have an interest rate swap and the swap uh, wasn't calculated correctly. So you may have, a, you know, say a $10 million loss when in reality there should be no loss at all uh, and in other type of derivative contracts. Well, we've all had the experience of signing long documents and having the person on the other side of the table say, you don't really need to, to read it. You just click here and you can sign it. And so then they come to you with a problem later and it says here on page 49 that I accept all risk. Have you dealt with situations like that where the, uh, the, the claim is that it was all accepted here in this lengthy, lengthy document? Yeah. And sometimes that poses a real problem for the case um, because words have meaning and your signature has meaning. It has legal meaning. When you sign something saying that you've read and understood it, a court looking at it is going to find that you read and understood it. Um, But every situation is different. Um, And sometimes we'll have situations where you may have a signed subscription agreement that basically says, you're probably going to lose all your money. This is a terrible idea. And the person signed it. But you may have a parallel sales piece 
that says this is a conservative investment and you're likely to double your money. Um, or in situations where those sales materials are just grossly misleading. I mean, we represented a group of investors in claims against a large financial institution where the product was actually called 100% principal protected and it went to zero. Um, so there were written risk disclosures, but when the product itself and the term sheet say it's 100% principal protected and it has various illustrations and none of those illustrations show the investor getting anything other than 100 cents on the dollar, um, then some other parallel risk disclosures certainly are not the death knell to a case. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, I could, I, I can see how that could be very challenging to try to overcome because words do have meaning, but of course, courts can look at the relative bargaining power of each and also contemporaneous statements if they can l- believe that the person was told just go ahead and sign it. You know, they especially if they show that it was emailed to me and it was signed within five minutes. There's no way I would have read a hundred pages in that period of time. Or especially if the cover email says something to the effect of this is our standard deal, just please initial, you don't need to look at anything other than page 49 where you sign it. Yeah, or, or worse, which happens a lot in the financial services industry is uh, a financial advisor or a sales assistant will have the client, the investor, sign documents in blank and send them back. And then they basically just Frankenstein the documents back together, even though the person never actually read or signed the documents, they just signed the last page. Wow, wow. So let's, uh, we've got the, the, a few minutes left here, maybe 10 or so. Uh, any cases you want to tell us about that are particularly interesting that might be uh, either illustrative for some of our uh, audience members or just particularly stressful or interesting in other ways you'd like to share with us? Um, sure. Uh, we recently had a, an arbitration award in a case earlier this year against the financial institution, and it was similar to what I was describing before. The financial institution had sold a private equity investment to primarily wealthy, uh, relatively sophisticated investors. And the financial institution's defense was, well, they were sophisticated, you know, they knew all the risks. And we got the internal communications and we found that the financial institution had done extensive homework on the investment and had raised a bunch of red flags and had come just shy of concluding that they shouldn't sell the product anymore because of undisclosed conflicts of interest. And uh, the, I'm sorry, my, my Zoom just went out for a minute there. And ultimately the arbitration panel agreed with us because the law in the securities world is the financial institution does have an obligation to do due diligence And it doesn't matter if you have a $1,000 net worth or a $10 billion net worth, investors have the right to be told the truth and only to be presented with products that have been adequately vetted. Um, And in that situation, the client's product hadn't been adequately vetted and the arbitration panel was not happy with that behavior and gave our clients every dollar they lost plus interest and gave the clients a full award of attorney's fees. So the clients were totally made whole. Now that's that's a bit rare, um, but it acted as a cautionary tale to financial institutions that in defending those types of cases have typically taken the position that if you have a wealthy client, wealthy must mean sophisticated. And it doesn't. Um, otherwise, every wealthy musician who may or may not have graduated from high school or, or, or college um, would also be sophisticated. And that's just not true. So we're we're certainly proud of that result. Um, and that result is indicative of, of, of other cases, other similar cases as well. Mm. It is interesting, isn't it? We, uh, we had a case early on in the federal discovery area that involved uh, uh, electronic documents. And we did a discovery request and the other side sent us the equivalent of trash bags full of documents. And they basically said, uh, whatever we have would be here in the last two years of communication. So happy reading. And it was way too much to look at. So we were able to get the court to command them to give us only the pertinent electronic files. And amazingly, after going through that, we found an email that basically said, uh, this guy, the plaintiff, would never, will never know 
he'll, he'll never know that we didn't pay him. So just, just stonewall him. And this was in after two tries to get the documents correct what they were sending us. I'm not suggesting they should have shredded it, but it was pretty amazing to have a total smoking gun. It's a, a, a well over a billion dollar judgment for a company that, uh, first of all, who thinks that way? Who wants to try and stiff the other person? And who puts it in an email? And then who delivers it to the other side? So it's, it is remarkable when uh, I, I use this example because it was against a huge company. And you would think that big companies kind of have their ducks in a row and they do things by the book and by and large, they're honest. But big companies are only comprised of the people in them. And whether it's Volkswagen and the diesel gate or otherwise, there are people who are in companies who may think they're doing the right thing for a good reason. But with enough digging, uh, people like yourself can find it and actually make it worthwhile for them to bring these actions. Yeah. And these cases are all about the document discovery. And in the age we live in, there are so many internal emails. And even so, I started my career 15 years ago, and I started working at a law firm even before I became a lawyer in 2004 as a law clerk. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the, the volume of discovery that that we had was so much less than it is now because people primary people are usually prolific emailers. I mean, in the course of a given day, people don't realize they probably send and receive hundreds of emails. At least people in the financial services business and people put some pretty dumb things in an email mm -hmm. that you often can't believe there is a there was a case and it was another case I'm very proud of we represented a single family office and the woman was not remotely sophisticated and she inherited it was somewhere between three and five hundred million dollars and she kind of had a merry group of misfits uh, running her family office and they had reached out to a large bank who had recommended a hedge fund link derivative to her. And basically what that means is it was, a, it was a derivative product that was linked to a basket of hedge funds. And they recommended she invest $40 million. And the internal emails were absolutely shocking. And in the beginning, we weren't really sure you know, how much really happened. We filed the case. We certainly had a good faith basis to file the case, but the internal emails were, this woman has no idea. She doesn't understand this product. I mean, all the types of things that if you're a bank, you don't want your professional saying like, let's close this deal and make a million dollars today. Um, I mean, just, just a combination of emails that ultimately gave a lot of, a lot of settlement value to the case. It is amazing, isn't it? Well, that, that's the good thing about uh, kind of righting the wrongs. I, I think we share a belief that there are people who do the wrong thing in this world and they should be held accountable. And it's a very rewarding thing to be able to help make that happen. Yeah, that's, that's I, I feel good when I get up in the morning. All right. So sorry, we had a little technical glitch there. I don't think we can blame anybody in particular. So we'll just say sorry about that. But uh, through the wonders of modern science, we're back to say goodbye. Uh, Brian, thank you for your time today. It's an interesting conversation. I hope our audience has enjoyed it. You know how to reach Brian if you have any questions that you'd like him to answer. And uh, certainly be sure to check in with the Holt Lawyer Network about um, what, can be, uh, what they can offer you as well. Brian, do you have any closing remarks? Um, no, Tim. Thank you very much. This has been a great experience. Um, I can be reached at Brian, B-R-I-A-N, at levinlawpa.com, L-E-V-I-N-L-A-W-P-A.com. And our, our direct office line is 305-402-9050. Please feel free to call me with any questions anytime. Um, and Tim, thank you again. I'm very grateful for this experience. You're welcome. It was a, a good conversation. And if uh, my email is easy, it's tl at jmbm.com. I've had that email address since the internet was invented. So it's pretty, <laughs> I guess you can tell I've been doing this for a while. Uh, we don't use carrier pigeons anymore. But uh, in any event, Brian, thank you. It was very interesting. And uh, I look forward to staying in touch. Thanks, Tim. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye.